My name is Indimuli Zaha. I am 23. I'm a Gen Z. <laughs> uh, I'm a human rights defender and I serve at Amali organization as a founder and executive director. We still focus as well on inclusive youth development and the intersection between development and health amongst young people. So we touch base on things like, you know, um, sexual reproductive health and rights, which is why we are also in the front line of the end femicide KE movement. Uh, but specifically for this protest, um, because there's no necessarily one organizational ownership. We participated in that to ensure that everyone is safe and also very aware of their surrounding and consciously aware of you know, why they're there. So through civic education, also trying as much as possible to assist, mobilize um, young people to understand the issues. Because I think at the junction for the finance, for the finance bill, passed a while ago, people are looking at generally um, what is governance currently and we fully focus on that and ensuring that young people are empowered on not only understanding um, their civic rights but also making sure that they know they're supposed to be protected. So for the protest, we personally on a personal level, um, I joined uh, to volunteer for the medical team. And it was actually very insta instantaneously because in the other protests, when I was there, I was there as a human rights defender, monitoring, evaluating, assisting um, with the crowds. You know, for as, for as long as I was there, I think we were just doing what everyone else was doing, trying to keep everyone safe. Uh, but on Occupy Parliament is when I decided to volunteer for the medical team because we had had complaints that they were overwhelmed. And of course, we're having millions of people on the streets. Of course, there are casualties and injuries. So assisting a million people, even if you're 2,000 of you, is, can be very challenging. And on that the very same day that I decided, yeah, let's help the medical team is exactly when I had that encounter. Um, where we had a couple of medical terms, but I was stuck at um, Cardinal Lotunga, that avenue, City Hall Avenue, uh, by the time I had gotten to town. Um, so I decided to join the medical team that was around Basilica. And when we went there, immediately I got there, the first casualty that we saw was a police officer. Um, I think he drew out the, the canister, but I think he inhaled a lot of gas. And they also have a lot of protective gear. So it was actually uh, somebody choking out of the gas. And of course, on instincts, because when we are there, we're looking at every single human. That's the reason why we are called human rights defenders, whether you're a cop, whether you're a civilian. And so automatically, instantaneously, I go for the person and we assist the officer. Then the fella, the, the individual who, uh, the other police officer, the colleague who was holding him as well, started shouting at me. And I'm like, first of all, I'm on a reflector that indicates um, my position in the protest. But importantly, I'm trying to help. He's choking, you do not know what to do. And you're acting as if you're in control and your friend is choking. And I'm trying to open up some of these gears because he's losing breath. And he's yelling all over my face. And I'm like, calm down Zaha. Everybody's emotions are high and I still need to do my job. So I told him, can you calm down? I'm trying to help. He made me curse out and loud. <laughs> I was like, I'm trying to help. At the end of the day, we picked him up. I called um, the rest of the team. We took him to the tent. So that was the first encounter of the day. And I was just like, I just got here. And the person I am helping, or rather I am mandated to help since we are all in the protest, uh, is the same, same group of people that are trying to traumatize the experience. And we kept quiet. Across the entire protest, we had people with injuries. I had to sit on the fence of Holy Family Basilica, giving water closing up wounds, um, ensuring that I'm telling people, please move, because now with the crowds, we're going to have a stampede on top of a fence. I'm Muslim, I'm in a dress. So automatically, the difficulties of even just being on top of a fence, giving people water, it was a difficult process. And you see, even by law, medics, we are protected and medical spaces are protected so that even when they get injuries, we are able to accommodate them and assist them because the whole point is to minimize loss of life as much as possible. 
and also just realizing that this is something that people have been given a democratic chance to do. They are mandated and supported by the constitution to protest. Nobody is over there attending, looking at, I want to loot the Gen Z protest, I think, from the beginning had been very peaceful until that fateful time for the Occupy Parliament. So I think my encounter now for the evening where the video came in, which I had no idea <laughs> there was a camera person, I think me, I was fully focused on, on the job and we had already heard that one of our colleagues had been shot dead who happened to be a doctor. Mm -hmm. And so, of course, automatically, a lot of even the volunteers had started retreating mm -hmm. to head home. So we are having minimal resources, minimal personnel, um, minimal access to information outside. And so what, what we are doing in the tent is that we are also trying to accommodate those that are scared and having frights because those are also anxiety attacks. So these are millions of people, different diversities of issues that you have to attend and we're like five of us. <laughs> it started slowly by me hearing gunshots. And we were at the parking lot of Holy Family and I'm like, where is those gun gunshots coming from? But you're looking at the five patients who are over there, your mind has to be there. And I hear another one and that's when I was like, no way, they cannot be shooting right outside or rather close to the medical tent. And clearly people started moving and running away from, from them. But there was a barrier at the gate in the Holy Family, so the cops are outside, and it's just crowds and crowds of people. And of course, with all that, all that, you know, the gunshots, people are running around. The police decide to throw out tear gases. And in the commotion, we had patients who were stepped on. We had people, everything went in rampage. Um, by the time I am trying to get to another casualty who was being brought in. It was another police officer with an open wound. And I'm trying my best to get him in, in, into the tent to try and how to see what, what can we do about it because we're limited resources. And I'm like, there's tear gas in the air. This thing is not supposed to be anywhere around open wounds. But importantly, we have a lot of flammables that are there that people are trying to utilize to sanitize and just do their work. And they are throwing tear gas inside the tent. And I just marched forward to where I had the gunshots. And I remember before I left the tent, I told myself, Ya Allah, I'm going to go. This is the fellow that I'm hearing the gunshots right on where I'm going, but that's where the police are and they don't understand that inside here we have a medical tent, including their fellow police officers. I'm going to walk straight there. Whatever happens, I know this is my intention. <laughs> this is an This is an so I walked and I marched and remember they, they usually use this, this tactic where, where they throw the tear gas and everyone you know is in between the smoke is when they shoot at people and so I was automatically sure the way they were shooting recklessly I would get a wound and so we just ran ran and there was this young young individual young man who walked with me he was like Dr. Twente. <laughs> Um, and by the time I'm getting to the police, I'm just seeing a crowd of people laughing, talking and giggling and chatting in groups and they have blocked the road. And I think first of all I got there and my heart was so crushed because I'm like resources are just where I'm right behind them trying to get to the medical tent but they're over there blocking with their lorries and all that. <laughs> And when I got there, I don't know even where the words came from really, but I, 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 I just asked them, honestly speaking, we have, I have doctors over there trying their best to save lives. We have very minimal doctors here and, very, and a good number, of course, of first aiders and all other medical team of shareholders. But I have patients, including your own police officers, that we were actually just attending to as you shot at us and threw that tear gas at us. 
and we also had patients who required to be shifted all the way to the to the to the hospitals and i'm trying to get an ambulance and i'm over there screaming in between a place filled with tear gas and they cannot allow ambulances to come and pick people and we're having people who are bleeding and breathing out blood because what <coughs> of the same same gunshots but I even try to insist to them, we're not even, you know, hatubagu yatam too. If a police officer is brought, we treat. If somebody is brought, we treat. Why would you be tear gas in a medical tent where people are trying to get solace and trying to get their injuries out of their pain? And he really dead us, looked at me. <laughs> he, he looked at me dead in the eyes pointed that rungu at me and told me, I go back, ni rudiuko, he's gonna kill more that I'm supposed to wait for. And another fella behind him was like, eh, na bado atujaanza. And I stood there in so much horror. Because I could only believe what I had seen in the tent and looking at somebody who I believe has children, has families. <laughs> when you hear somebody saying, go back, I'm killing more that you have to wait for. I have never been broken like that. And I insisted because now I'm like, at the end of the day, I need to go back there and treat those people and I need to assist everyone else in doing their job. At the end of the day, if they don't stop throwing these canisters, people will die there. And I begged him, I'm like, please, just stop throwing canisters. That's all I'm asking. I'm not saying don't continue with your work. I'm saying stop throwing them inside the church. We're having kids that are scared, that are crying, that are seeing their parents over there being treated with open gunshot wounds. And there was a child there who a tear gas canister had just broken out there. And that thing went straight to the child's heart. So we have closed the wound, waiting for an ambulance. And I'm over there being told to go back and wait for more dead bodies. And I don't think I've ever, I don't think I've ever broken the way I did. But I was like, oh, at the end of the day, I'm going to go back and assist the rest with tear gas or not. Uh, put on, we had put on that cold gate because people had told me, you know, it helped out. I didn't even care. I looked back at Basilica with all the smoke. I wore my gear. I took my scarf and I closed it up on the top of my face. And we went back. And unfortunately, as we went back, there was another crowd from the parliament parking. As I went back, I just got back to the tent. They tears dust us again. And I don't know, I, I, I think after that, it has really taken a lot out of me. Because now it had, to, it, had to, it had to be us physically carrying the patients, physically carrying everyone to take them all the way to the other side of Basilica to try and find an ambulance. We're getting there with all the injured people. I'm being told, Zaha, there's no ambulances. Ambulances, ziku hapi jamanini. Ambulance imenda huko kusafirisha wa ishimiwa. And I'm like, you cannot tell me we are stuck with patients. The police on the other side are telling me they are about to kill more we should wait for. And we don't have ambulances because the MPs are trying to escape with them. I just broke down. I think I sat there, we broke down. We tried thinking, we tried at the end of the day, the ambulance was coming after almost half an hour. And by the time they're coming, you have to also pick out which patient is a casualty, which one is not, who is going, who is not. Staffing patients in, taking patients over there. And then when people heard that MPs were being, you know, um, fled off with the ambulances, they were stoning ambulances. So ambulances that went all the way to hospital could not be able to come back. And you can imagine what we had there. And I did look at those police and I, I don't think there's any curse I do not have for them. Because I couldn't believe that they would block us from assisting, including themselves. Because now it became a problem of we are not discriminating any officer and any protester. We are treating everyone. You guys hate each other that much. 
that even if I mention your colleague is there, it doesn't move you a bit. It doesn't move you that children are there. It doesn't move you that human beings are there with gunshot wounds. And you're telling me to my face that I should go back and wait for more dead bodies that I should deal with. I don't think I've, this, it was the most unfortunate experience. But thankfully, by the time we were leaving there at 6 p.m., most of them had been transferred to hospitals, and I'm glad Kenyans came together and paid those medical bills. It was such a horror at Basilica, and they had tear gas. Not, that was not the first time, but on the other end, oh, I think, I don't know, I can't tell. There's this blue, is it an airtel building over there? Right opposite is where we had the first medical tent. They are tear gas there as well, but it wasn't as intense because in this other end, everywhere was smoke. But yeah, it, it was horrific. And it just has to say a lot about what happens even in the trainings for the police. We're not supposed to dehumanize them. Their service is the reason why they stopped. They became a service. It is, it is out of love that we serve human beings. It was very unfortunate that I would not, I was not able to receive assistance from the people that we are supposed to get assistance from. I started thinking about what then happens in police stations then, when people are reporting issues and cases. Do they get the same, same experience whereby you're being told you should go and wait for your demise? But equally, what guides that school of thought in a police institution? And what does it have to say about brutality? Because again, people are putting a very blind eye on what police brutality as a crisis is in the country. Order and peace should be maintained by the people that cause it. I don't think so. It's narcissistic. It cannot make sense. That training should be looked at. But importantly, even the police should have a recollection. You have children. You're part of families, you're a child to someone. They felt the pain when one of their officers had been, had been killed or when the canister blew up his arms. Why can't they feel the same, same to Mwananchi? And I can only imagine if it was a normal person who did not have a reflector coming to talk to them, how they were answering citizens. I was in the medical team and they gave me the best that they had that day. <laughs> I really haven't. It took a lot out of me. But of course, you see, the good thing about this revolution is that it also embraces the very tiniest of efforts. And so as little as still ensuring that I can check in on the medical teams, the ones I know, and find out how they are, but importantly also holding space for everyone else, including protesters, trying to educate what can you do as first aid in case somebody has an issue. It has also been part of a good process. So I haven't been able to be there physically, but everybody knows we have been in the fight for a very long time. Us taking a step back does not put a stop on the revolution and the mo motive that Gen Z wants to achieve. I think for the overall good, it gave a limelight of the truth that people were trying to set across, that police are actually crossing a boundary, that they have stopped being one of our own. Yeah, You know, it's like having to be killed by your own sibling because we are brothers and sisters, and I think that's what they don't understand. The Gen Z language does not know any single tribe, any single change, any single class. And so when we look at them, we were thinking, we are on the same team, it's just that they are on duty, and their duty that day was to protect civilians, but unfortunately they were the perpetrators. So it rang very differently for me. I was, I was uh, and, and I'm thankful, I was in another whole program again, as human rights defenders, you're always on the verge of a fight. So we were handling um, some, some work in Kajado County on climate justice, because again, we're also trying to look at the intersect between climate and health, which also still affects young people. And we are from a meeting, <laughs> and it was the, one of the waiters that came, Madam, <laughs> and I'm like, ah, you need me wafi? So they showed me the video, and I'm like, oh my God, there was a camera person? There was somebody with a camera there. There was even anybody who saw us over there suffering. 
after I watched the video, and by the time I was going back to the meeting, everybody was like, yo, Zaha, you were everywhere. Mm. But, you know, for me, ah, especially as a, as a HRD, this does not look like the correct time for fame. You know, there's nothing so grand. I was doing my job. And if, if me doing my job has been able to create space for the truth to be able to be seen out in light, then I think I am grateful, alhamdulillah, that I'm able to see that change can happen through such an instance because it was just me, myself, gunshots, tear gas, and police. I really didn't look around to visualize and see what was going on. It was a shock, and I think uh, Obra, who happened to reach out to me as well, it's like I was trying to look for your account. I had this. It took me a lot to post it out, and you can tell it emotionally took a toll on people because they saw the reality of things. Uh, that thing has, I left it at like one point something million viewers yesterday and it is everywhere. But importantly, I hope it gives grace and it sheds light into those difficulties. Because again, we should, they're really trying to make enemies out of people in this protest. We, and when I say we, I think it's every Gen Z, it feels like we're really on the streets for a collective action and the demonism that is happening in the terms of even the goons that are being paid to come and destroy the protest. If people can look at it as it is, that this is people calling out for change, there's really nothing much. It's just that people should do their job. People should stop being opulent on taxpayers' money. It's simple as prioritize things that matter, like education and healthcare. And it's such a pain to have you know, a government raising uh, salaries for MPs, yet they are being told exactly where that money should go and what exactly it should touch on. It feels very triggering to have to explain to human beings that they're supposed to be human. It, it's strange. And I think that's why for Gen Z's it's very collective. Everybody's feeling that pain. And we're also in an era where these young people are having a lot of mental health awareness. So they can point out narcissism when they see it. They can point out lies. They can port, point out gaslighting. And when these things are being pointed out from politicians, they're not supposed to be raged. They're supposed to be happy that they have a population of those that are aware. It is, it is strange and very challenging, but I'm hoping as we continue as a democracy, this generation is showcasing a very good pathway because the other time we had such a big revolution that is very un, you know, uh, unpoliticized was during the Mau Mau. These were people who were fresh from their villages. And when the white man came, the revolution began from a point of no contention. People did not know each other. This is a big time for people to even study how are these young people mobilizing without a particular point person? It means there is collective goodwill out of Kenyans to do what is right. And maybe politicians can just reflect and for the first time do what is right and abide by their citizens.